I am the good shepherd. We've been looking at four of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes while he was here on, on planet Earth. Last week was I am the... Yes, thank you so much. I just didn't know who was going to know if I am. So. I am the vine was last week. I appreciate that. It just like forms my heart. Yeah, I used to do this thing in youth group called Last Week Recap. And I'd have my interns recap the week before. And it was just painful to hear what people actually heard from my message the week before. And so, it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But uh, I am the good shepherd is this, is this week. I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, it says, I, the, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd. That lends to believe that there must be some shepherds out there that are not good. Okay? I heard a preacher talking one time, and he said he was in his room, and he was uh, watching a shepherd um, hitting the sheep and, and, and driving them forward. He was driving the sheep. Okay? Now, if you think out on the farm, you had a cattle dog, the cattle dog would come up and bite the heels of the sheep. They drive the cows. He was, they were driving the sheep. And he went up to one of the local guys, and he asked them, well, you know, I've always, people, I've heard in my Sunday school class for years that it, it's, that the sheep follow the shepherd. And why is that shepherd then driving the sheep? And a local guy said, well, that's not the shepherd, that's the butcher. <laughs> okay? <laughs> sheep don't know the voice of the butcher. Okay? But there are fake uh, there are fake shepherds. In John 10, 1, it says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief or a robber. And of course, the person that he's talking about there is Satan. He has a plan for your life. We hear God has a plan. Satan has a plan for your life. It's found in John chapter 10, verse 10. It says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And so basically, the enemies, the thieves, the one climbing over the fence, his plan for your life is to hurt you as much as he possibly can, and then kill you and drag you to hell. That's his plan for your life. His plan for your life is to hurt the people in your family as much as possible on planet Earth, and then kill them and drag them to hell. That's his plan for your life. But what a contrast. The plan that God has for us. My purpose is to give a rich and satisfying life. Now, you look through the scripture, we know, and, and this is one of the points that the case for faith makes, actually, that the disciples, the ones that Jesus is talking to, almost all of them would give up their lives for the truth. Some of them would be crucified, some of them would be stoned, some of them, different things happened to each one of them, and they were killed. Now, one of the reasons why we know that uh, Jesus really did get up from the grave is because nobody dies for a lie. They'll die for an idea, they'll die for a fake belief, but they won't die for a first-person lie, at least not 12 people in a row, okay? I think one of them maybe died in old age, I forget which one it was, but they... And so, it just doesn't happen. And so, but God's plan is a rich and satisfying life. So these people that Jesus is saying this to, is your life is going to be rich, and it's going to be satisfying. And these guys would give their lives for Jesus. But you know what happens when I've learned? That when I get to know God, and I know His voice, and I'm tracking with Him, and, and, I, and I love Him so much, that is a rich and satisfying life. It's something that the world can't even begin to put its, fin its finger on. And if you don't know what I'm talking about this morning, and maybe you even become to church some, but there's not something inside of you that is like, oh, this is good. I'm going through something hard, but it, it's, it's, it's rich, and it's satisfying. Now, sheep are mentioned over 200 times in the Bible, all right? Now, just, it, it's the most mentioned animal in all of the Bible. And to give you an idea, dogs are mentioned 44 times in the Bible. Any dog people? Any, any, any cat people? Okay, cats never mention. <laughs> Not one time in the scripture. Okay, I know what you're thinking though. 
you're thinking, yes, they are. They are, you know, there's lions in the Bible. And of course, lions are cats. And it's like, well, uh, that is true. But didn't we just, didn't we just uh, capture that? You know, Jesus said that he comes like a roaring lion to seek and devour you. And so basically, he captured the devil. And so, that's, that's what I get from it. That's, he's, sorry. But it's, we are compared to sheep in the scripture. Over and over and over again, we are compared to sheep. In the Old Testament, we're compared to sheep. In the New Testament, we're compared to the sheep. And I want to tell you this morning that that isn't exactly a compliment, okay, to be compared to sheep. Sheep are dumb animals, all right? They are dumb animals. They're stupid. Have you ever seen a trained sheep at the circus? No, you don't see a sheep. Have you ever seen a, 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 a trained lion? Sure, I guess a cat, I guess. That they weren't really that, you know, they, they, the lions didn't do much at the circus. Did you notice that? They hopped on different platforms and they jumped from one hoop. But, and then the white one was in the middle for a minute. But you, you never see a trained sheep. There's one trick you can train a sheep to do. You can say, play dead. Problem is, you can only do it once because you shoot him in the head right after you say that. <laughs> That's how you train a sheep to play dead. But oh I'll hear all week, folks. I don't know. Um, <coughs> the, the dumb animals. I've heard it said. I, I've never, never actually worked that much with sheep. I've seen them on farm and stuff, but we never had sheep on work. I was, but I, I've heard it said that if they walk through a gate and they get stuck because two trying to get through at one time, they will sit there. They have no reverse. Okay, so they will push and, and push and push, and they'll just they'll just sit there. Dogs have reverse because my dog will get stuck and stuff, and then she's she's too big to turn around and she'll. Kind of back up. Some of you been in my house have seen her do that. She's stuck behind the dog. Um, so do- dogs will do that. But we are compared to sheep in the Bible. And whether we like it or not, that's how God looks at us. And so I thought, Jesus said, I am the shepherd. And so we are sheep. That's what he's talking about. So what do we need to know about sheep? There are four challenges to being a sheep that I want to tell you about. Number one, sheep get lost easily. Isaiah 53, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep get lost, okay? They get lost. They forget where they're going. They forget what they're talking about. Did you see the weather outside today? Because we went from church. That was, what was I talking about again? Uh, They get distracted. They see a little something. We're walking with Elizabeth, and she sees a twig that she has to have. And she, you know, and she, and then she starts walking away. Yeah, she does that here. She'll end up on the other side of the movie theater. And I'm like, hey, kid, people will kill you if they catch you. Like, How bad do you scare your kid to stay close to you? I don't know. She's like looking at me like I'm crazy. There's nobody like that. No, they will kill you. Um, but they get lost easily. And we, we get distracted easily. And, and the tragedy of tragedies, you read through the, the Old Testament, and you see this happening to God's people over and over and over again. One king would be good, but then they would start to get distracted. Study the most tragic, one of the most tragic stories in all of Scripture is Solomon. He is so incredibly wise that at the end of his life, it's not even clear, clear that Solomon is going to be in heaven because the Bible says that he let foreign women come and he got distracted a little at a time. By the time he's at the end of his life, it says that he was participating in the worship of Moloch. Now, the Bible does not say that, that Solomon burned his kids in the fire. It doesn't say that. But that's how, that was the most common uh, worship of Moloch in the Bible. It is possible that Solomon, the wisest person ever in the world, is in hell today unless he came back to God or whatever because he got distracted. He, he got distracted, and a little at a time. It happened a little bit at a time, and that's how distraction is. All of a sudden, God isn't the most important thing in your life. Your eyes get off on something else. The enemy doesn't move you quick. He's smarter than that. It's just a little at a time. Number two, sheep are defenseless. They're defenseless. If a, a couple of wolves want to take down a sheep, the sheep is dead. Okay? The sheep is defenseless. It relies on the shepherd. It relies on the sheepdog. All right, it relies on somebody else besides itself for protection. It is completely defenseless. You are completely defenseless. Well, thank you, Pastor Scott. I'm so grateful. I uh, look in the scripture and look at all the places where we're supposed to fight Satan. All right, in, in the Lord's Prayer, 
it says, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Okay? Paul says to young people, he says, flee the evil desires of youth. Uh, of youth. You look in the Bible and you look at all of the, oh, I could unpack this. Um, they're dealing with demons in the New Testament. And just, you know, I believe in demons. And, and at one point, the disciples were trying to cast out a demon. And the demon was not responding. They were unable to cast out this demon. And Jesus says to his disciples, oh, yeah, this kind can only come out with prayer and fasting. You know what that tells me? That tells me the only way to deal with this kind of demon is for you to run to me twice as hard. He didn't say that you need to rebuke it this way. He didn't say that you need to do so many chants. You see, you know how you deal with a really tough demon? Because I'll, I'll tell you this, I've learned this about fasting. Fasting is not about getting stuff from God. Fasting is about letting God letting you know what he wants from you. It doesn't move God closer to you. It moves you closer to God. That's what fasting does. And so Jesus is basically saying, even when you deal with the biggest, toughest, baddest demons and they're not responding, the answer is not to fight them. You don't argue, you know, so there's, there's people, if you uh, search uh, deliverance ministry or demonology on YouTube, you can see some freaky stuff. There's people out there that they'll, they'll be demons manifesting and they're arguing with the demon and they're trying to bind strongholds and they're trying to do all this mathematical demonology stuff. And, and I don't even know. I think sometimes they're messing with real demons. I don't know. I mean, God knows better than me. Sometimes I think it's emotional problems. But I think sometimes they're poking a stick at some incredibly bad stuff. But that's not what we see in the scripture. What we see in the scripture is, if the demon is really bad, you run to me twice as hard. And so you were never intended to defend yourself. You were intended to rest in the arms of Jesus. You were intended to be close to the shepherd. And when you are close to the shepherd, you will be protected. So, you ever heard somebody? I walked into this, uh, this place, and afterward, I had to pray all these demons off of me. Okay? I want to tell you, that does not line up with Scripture. If you walk in the most demon-infested spot on the planet, and the biggest, most gruesome demons, the only way that they can hurt you even the tiniest bit is if one of two things happens. Okay? If number one... You do something stupid and you step out from God's protected protection. Okay, because you can do that. You can rebel against God. You can disobey him. Disobey him. You walk away from the shepherd. Okay, that's dumb. The sheep are dumb. But that's we'll get to that in a minute though. Um, but that's the only way. The other way is, and we see that God does this sometimes in the Scripture. He says about Paul that he allowed a servant of Satan to torment him. We see that he, uh, both Saul's actually, it happened to the Apostle Saul and it happened to King Saul in the Old Testament. We see that there are different times in the Bible when the Lord allows Satan to do something to somebody because he allows it. But that's his, his discipline. Um, sheep, sheep are very stubborn. Anybody here sitting by sheep? <laughs> they're, very, they're very stubborn. Sheep are not clean animals, all right? The, the, if you ever saw sheep in a field, they are not the white, fluffy things that you see on TV, okay? Uh, imagine that you are wearing your grandma's wool sweater that she gave you that is really scratchy, okay? And then you roll around in the dirt, you roll it around, well, they, have, they have sticks in them, they have gunk in them. They're, they're very, very dirty animals. And just like, we are dirty. We can't get clean without the shepherd's help. Uh, so what does the shepherd do? He guides. He guides me along right past, it says in Psalm chapter 23, for his namesake. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd, and the sheep recognize his voice to come to him. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. You know you're his sheep, and you're close to the shepherd when you know his voice. When you know his voice. What do you mean? Have you ever been uh, in, in a park or something like that? And you, you're there, and you're not maybe watching your kid quite like you should, and then you hear crying, and, and kids are crying all over the place. But then you hear a different cry, and it's the cry of one of your kids. And you know exactly what's happening. You know that that's your kid. 
because you know your kid's voice. You're familiar with your, your kid's voice. The only way that you get to know something so intimately as the, tenace, the, the tone of your own kid's voice or cry is because you spend so much time with them. And, and you're with them all the time. You get so that you know his voice. If you don't know your kid's voice, you haven't spent much time with your kid. And if you don't know God, you haven't spent much time with your God. He's a very relational God. Not Okay, I see that I lost him. You read next, okay? And so imagine for a minute, and I, I was with a group of people at this house a few months, and you had a, a few dogs, and you went to your buddy's house and had a few dogs, okay? And you let those dogs run, and then off in the hills, the dogs are all going after something, and they're all barking, and you can pick out the bark of your dog. Okay, that's the same concept. I lost you the whole kid. Um, <clears throat> he provides. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. If, when the Lord is your shepherd, you lack nothing. That doesn't say you want nothing. Okay? I want what I want. I don't want Jeremiah to go. I think it sucks. I'm not that, I don't think it's that too, God. I'm just telling you. Um, but we lack nothing. You know? We lack nothing. What, well, Scott, but I do lack. I have all this stuff in my life. You know what? When you are living that rich and satisfied life in Jesus, you lack nothing. You will push through obstacles. You'll push through hard times, clinging to the robe of of your shepherd. And look at this. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He doesn't just let us lie down in green pastures, but he makes us lie down in green pastures. This is unique because sheep will not lie down unless they feel safe. They will not lie down unless they feel safe. They'll be up. They'll be keeping a watch out. It's only when they feel safe that he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And sometimes I almost feel like I, I'm, he's making me lay down and I'm, I'm still nervous and I'm wanting to get up. No, get down. Okay, no, but Lord, I have to accomplish all this stuff on myself, on my own. No, get down. You know, that's kind of spoke to me. And he leads me beside the still waters. The reason why that's important is sheep will only drink out of quiet waters. If you bring them to a river that is raging, they won't drink. Well, think about it. Little cotton balls floating down the river, right? You know, if you ever, um, imagine you took your grandma's wool sweater, dipped it in water, and then threw it out. It's just You'll stay warm because wool stays warm, but you know, it's heavy and, and all that. And then it says, he refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. Next, he corrects his sheep. Wandering sheep don't like correction. Okay? Now, remember I said, the only way the devil can thump you is if you walk away from the shepherd. But you see how much he loves you? He loves you so much that when he sees you walking away, He'll give, you, he'll give you a little thump with his, with his little staff. And that's the most loving thing he could possibly do. Job 5.17, blessed is the one whom God corrects. Do not despise the discipline of the Lord Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. There's an old parable, I've heard it many times, um, that when a shepherd... It has a lamb that won't stay. This lamb is just always taken off and going the other direction. That shepherd will take that lamb and bring it over to a, a rock, put its leg across the rock, and he'll break the lamb's leg. And then he'll take and he'll splint that lamb's leg and he'll place it on his shoulders. And for the next period of time, he'll carry that lamb everywhere they go. He'll carry that lamb. And once he puts the lamb down again, then that lamb stays close because it's used to being so close to the shepherd. You see how beautiful that is? All of a sudden, now the sheep is smart enough that, boy, you boy, you got me in line. Boil it down one, one step further. Uh, you guys remember your kids' one-year uh, shots, okay? You've got a one-year-old kid. They're old enough to be conscious. They're old enough to kind of understand what's going on and and they're beginning to interact, and they know mom and dad. And uh, Inger Lisa was on the other side of the room when it was time for Elizabeth's one-year shots, okay? And so you got your kid down, and you're holding your kid down, right? Because they've got to give this shot. And you're looking at, oh, now I'm going to be happy, happy, 
happy, happy. And then that needle goes in, and, it, and this look goes over Elizabeth's face, and I can only assume it's, you know, and it was like, betrayer! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just like, what have you done to me? <laughs> now, the, uh, High girl was much better. They, they distracted her and stuff. Apparently, it doesn't work. They didn't do that with the one year old one. They just, they just hit her, you know? So she's looking in the eyes of daddy when that happened. Thank you so much um, for that. Sometimes the most loving thing that God can do is make your life hurt. I'm just telling you. I, you know, sometimes I'll pray for people and say, Lord, put a hedge of thorns around them. Well, we don't want their sin to destroy them, but sin needs to be uncomfortable. Lord, let them hit that spot. Let them hit that wall where they realize that death is on the other side. That's the most loving thing that God can possibly do for that person. And I, I would have kids in my youth group. I was a youth pastor for a whole bunch of years. And some parents would discipline their kids, and some parents wouldn't. Which parents were loving their kids? It was the ones that were disciplining their kids. I remember telling them one night, this kid was like all mad he was grounded or something. And I said, do you really think that your parents want to ground you? Do you know how unpleasant you are to have around when you're acting like this? <laughs> there is nothing they would like better than to say, please get out of the house. Grounding you is a colossal pain in the butt, okay? <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. It's, but that's not the way they, they process it because sheep and kids and we tend to be a little bit dumb. And so, in Hebrews 12, 11, and this is talking about adults, no discipline is pleasant at the time, but it's painful. If it, if it wasn't painful, it wouldn't be discipline. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. But where do you find the righteousness? You find it at the hem of the garment of the shepherd. You find the righteousness in the being clean when you're close to Jesus. And peace for those who've been trained by it. When you all of a sudden get it, that I don't have to keep running away. I can just stay close. Oh, that's a good place to be. He protects. Even though I walk through the, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He is the protector. There was a kid who was in a college uh, class for, um, for a theater. And his teacher was a theater teacher. Okay, and This is a guy who wasn't that good, but couldn't make it in the real world, but I call it. So, um, he, he was very theatrical. So he gets out the 23rd Psalm, and he, he begins to read it. Even though I walk. And he did this dramatic version of the, of the 23rd Psalm. And, and he begins to read it. And then he says, I want one of you guys to do it. He says, Jake. And he's like, oh man, he'd never spoken in front. He, he took the class because his counselor had told him that you're uncomfortable in front of people. You need to keep them. Um, he had taken the class because he wanted to get outside of his, his shell. And, and so he begins to read. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And as he reads it, all of a sudden, he begins to think about what God has done for him in his life. And, and he reads it through, and by the end of the reading, the kid is crying. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I don't know how to describe this. I've seen this. I gave a speech once in high school where I shared about Jesus. And when I got done, there were two people in that classroom who were crying. And this kid gets done reading the 23rd of the psalm. And the students in that room are so moved because this obviously this guy really knows God. And the teacher gets up in that awkward silence. They're not, they don't quite know how to deal with the silence. And the teacher gets up and he says, well, now you've seen something. I know the psalm. But he knows the writer. 
one time Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, you know, it's kind of like there was a hundred sheep. And the shepherd had a hundred sheep, and one day he comes out and he sees that one of those sheep were gone. And he said, what, what that shepherd did is, is he looked at his 99 sheep and he said, you just stay there. And he leaves. And he searches for that one sheep. And when he finds that sheep, the Bible says that his heart rejoices. I want to tell you what makes your God's heart rejoice. And that is when one of his come home. And you're his. He claimed you. When he died on the cross for your sins, when he said, I'll be that shepherd, I'll be the one. And he put you in that place. And he called you his own. You are at the top of his mind this morning. You are at the top of his mind this morning when you have wandered away from him. Now you might be thinking, you may have come into this place thinking you and God were okay. There was, you know, there's not much I got to get done here. I go to church, I've been coming to the rock for a while, things are good, I try to be nice to my family, I pray once in a while, I come to church. But if, if God talked to you, you'd have no idea he was talking to you. If he talked to you, you wouldn't know he was talking to you. Can I tell you that there is a moment when God speaks to me and it's just him and I just know. I just know. Now, it's not infallible. It doesn't mean I tell you what God told me about your life. It's nothing like that. But when I hear his voice, it's just there. If you would know your kid's voice, if you would know your dog's bark, if you would know your husband or wife's voice, if you can hear the nuance and the tone of voice in your boss when he talks to you, whether you should bring up that, that problem you have with him. But you sit here this morning and you do not know the voice of God. Or you don't even know what that means. That's a whole other sermon. But can I tell you, when you know him, you know his voice. You want a measuring stick to know if everything's okay with you this morning? Do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? He grabbed you this morning and said, do this, because you know he was doing it, that he was that person. We're going to receive the offering in about two minutes' time. And as you prepare to receive it, I want to encourage you this morning that if you have walked away, how do I know if I've walked away? Do you know his voice? Have you spent the time with him that you need to spend with him that when he calls, you can just answer? If you're here today and you've gotten distracted, you've gotten stubborn, and you have been led astray, maybe life has even bit you. Remember what I said? The enemy gets to hit you for two reasons. Number one, you left God. Number two, because God is lifting his hand in protection. You know, sometimes the most loving thing God can do is to allow the enemy to sting you. Say, God did this to me. No, he didn't. What God did was he just lifted his umbrella. And that's how his chastisement comes. The Apostle Paul's chastisement came as a messenger from Satan. So sometimes God will use the devil to accomplish his ends. We see that in scripture all over and over again. Have you been stung? Don't be so dumb to say it was coincidence. Don't be so naive to say that, oh, it just has nothing to do with how I'm living. Don't be so angry to point to God and say, you did this to me. Don't be that dumb sheep that say, okay, God, you, I'm uncomfortable here and I hate it. But Lord, I'm going to run to you. I want that rich and satisfying life. That rich and satisfying life. I want to embrace your discipline, God. If that's you this morning, I want you to pray with me when I'm about to pray. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to give the Lord my life again. I just can't give it to him enough. I just can't lay it in front of him 
enough. He wants to know you. If you walked away, come home. I'm not really on his mind this morning. He just kind of left me behind and he's chasing you. If you feel a pull on your heart, if you're feeling that little awkward feeling that says, you know, Pastor Scott, it makes me uncomfortable when I hear how much you love Jesus. If that's you this morning, I want to tell you that that is the Holy Spirit. And he's hitting you today and he's pulling on you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything embarrassing. I'm not going to ask you to do it. What I'm going to ask you to do is two things. Pray with me. And take that step in giving him your all. I would be so grateful if you would let me know on that card. And all you have to do is put one cross if you're giving your life to the Lord for the first time. And two crosses if you've done it in the past. But you're saying, Lord, today there's a new line in the sand. Today there's a new beginning in my life. If either of those are you this morning, I would be so grateful if you'd let me in on the conversation. And, and, and let me know you made that decision. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to receive, receive the offer. And Lord, I pray that I could be closer to you. I see now that all that striving that we try to do, we try to be good enough, we try to grit our teeth and not sin. Lord, some of us try to do stuff for you, and God, I realize you don't need me to do anything for you. You just need me to stay close. You don't need me to be strong. You just need me to stay close. Lord, I pray that I could enjoy that rich and satisfying life. That rich and satisfying life. And Lord, I know I've been close to you enough and long enough to know what that rich and satisfying life is. Lord, all i got to know is that I'm close to you and doing what you asked me to do. That's it. Oh, Jesus, if I can just know that, I can just rest. Lord, we can go through in difficult times. We can go through challenges with people and professions and all those things. But, Lord, we will be tenacious as long as we can have that rich and satisfying life that says, I'm yours. God, I'm not going to fight the devil. I'm just going to rest in your arms. Lord, I'm not going to I'm not gonna grip my teeth and try to change people. I'm just going to rest in your arms. Lord, I'm not going to try to manipulate people into serving you. I am just going to do my best to exude your love. Lord, I pray that we could be a people, every one of us at the Rock Church, that the defining personality trait of our church would be that we would be so passionately in love with you that it would be our passion that would convict the hearts of people. Lord, that people would come into this place and they would be convicted and they would know how short they have fallen. Not because the preaching was legalistic and we told them they were bad. Not because of any of those things. But it would be because, Lord, let us be a beacon to your goodness. That the world could look at us and say, I'm lacking that. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here in this place and they don't know the passion that is closing their eyes with tears coming down both sides saying, Lord, I just want to be yours. My heart longs for you, God. It longs for you, God. Let us be that kind of church. I just ask you, Jesus, in Jesus' name.